You are listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. Make sure to subscribe to never miss any Pursuit of Manliness content and join our Pursuit of Manliness community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Pursuit of Manliness. Well, at this time, I want to welcome Stephen Mansfield to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. Stephen, thank you for taking time and being on today's show. Man, it's great to be with you again. Thank you. Well, brother, as I said, uh, before we started, you were very kind to me a few years ago when we were talking about Mansfield's book of Manly Men. I'm a big believer that all men need to have a library. And you have recently wrote another book that we need to add to that library, Men on, on Fire. And you, you pull no punches. You start off talking about the, the idiot man, the dog man. And um, could you just <laughs> tell us what lit that fire in you to say, hey, I, this, is the way I need to, this is the way I need to verbalize it and then let it resonate with the guys that read it. Well, I appreciate the question. As you know, I'd written a book called Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, which had really hit, done well, and gotten a lot of attention. But it was basically the basic maxims of, of noble manhood, how a man could get started, and then illustrating uh, the characteristics of noble manhood out of the lives of great leaders. So it was a fun read, a good read, an inspiring read. Uh, then I wrote uh, Building Your Band of Brothers. I wanted men to really know how to team up and how to have a band of brothers around them and not walk alone. Great. Uh, those books, uh, you know, wrote years ago, then continue to do well, continue to impact men. But as time went along, I noticed something missing in the lives of the men uh, that had been impacted by those books. Uh, even if they were pursuing noble manhood, uh, even if they were in a band of brothers, there's still something. And finally, I began to realize that there are certain elements of a man's life that ought to ignite a fire, a dynamo, energy, call it what you will. Uh, uh, you know, a nuclear reactor, whatever it is, in his heart. And a man can be in a band of brothers and he can be pursuing noble manhood. But if, for example, the fire of heritage does not burn inside of him, something's missing. If, for example, the fire of legacy, and of course I talk about both of these in the book, uh, is not burning within him, something's missing. So uh, it's, it's both a commentary on what I've written previously. I'm proud of both books, but the, I just realized there was something more. But it's also an observation from looking at the men around me, looking at the men in the world, on the street, in the mall, at the sport arena, and saying, you know what, there's something missing. And I, I, I gotta tell you, I'm not just trying to market here, I'm more excited about this book than I've been about the others. They've all had a great impact. I'm grateful to be part of the great men's movement, the men's movement that's going on in the world. But this book, as you've already said, I decided to hit away. And so I wrote passionately, I wrote as a coach, I wrote fiercely. You know, I speak directly. I speak like I'm talking to a bunch of guys in the locker room or on the team bus. And, um, and I, I think it's going to make a difference because it really gets down into the nitty gritty of a man's soul. Yeah, you, you talk about that, that men's movement. And, and I almost, I feel like I got burnt out reading books on masculinity. We're kind of repeating the same narrative over and over. And, and when I saw you had a new book, I, naturally I was, I was intrigued. And then I started to read it. I thought, okay, this is different. It hits different. And I think one of the, the tensions is there, are, there's a fire being lit in men and we are, you know, rising up and you see a lot of men's movements and men's accounts and social media. But the truth is when it comes to masculinity and pursuing it in the wrong fashion, we can actually do more harm than good. Then you, oh, you address that. Question. You address that in your book. Why is that? Why are we doing more harm than good? Well, first of all, you're right. We're retreading the same old thoughts. I mean, if, quite frankly, if I may be blunt, and I'm, and, and, I'm, and I'm only asking that to be polite because I'm going to be <laughs> blunt. I'm sorry, I can't really speak any other way. Um, the publishing itself is kind of an echo chamber. You got a couple of guys with new thoughts and then 50 other guys you know, recite the same stuff. And so I like to break out. That's probably the, the strength of my career is I'm just a God-given, maybe it's a rebelliousness. I like to break out of it. Uh, and so the books tend to be also, I'll have to say, most books, uh, a lot of the messages in the great man in, in, the, in the men's movement are about behave yourself. It's about don't touch that. Uh, and don't misunderstand me. I, I, you know, I want men to be moral men as well, but you can't guilt a man to greatness. So I want to inspire men to greatness. I want to call them to something. I want to show them what great manhood can be and then, then give them the path to it. So you're not going to find me if I'm speaking to a group of men. Uh, addressing porn, addressing masturbation, addressing lust, it will, it will be in there, but it's going to come down the list. Because I believe if you teach a man, uh, show him what a great man can be and inspire him to, uh, to reach it, 
then he will let go of the lesser things in his life that are holding him back. You know, I don't have to, I, I can't even see your body. So this is certainly no commentary on you. Uh, but if I'm telling you, I want to help you run marathons and I inspire you to run a marathon, I don't have to talk to you about your weight. You're going to stop eating crap food. You're going to lose weight and get in shape to run marathons. That's, that's easy because I've lit a fire in your soul. And that's, that's what I, where I think we're failing. I think we're not showing men what greatness looks like. We're not showing men what the glory of being a man can be, the power of it. Um, and, and as a guy, you know, as you, you've already said, I'm, I'm two guys. I'm a guy who speaks to men, but I also have written a lot of books on history and faith and politics. So I'm on, you know, Fox, CNN, in Washington all the time. And when I'm looking at what's going on in our current society, my, what I think will make a massive difference is a, is a massive movement of noble manhood uh, that changes what's happening in the streets, that changes this nasty racism that's dominating our society, that changes the anger and the violence and so on. I live in downtown Nashville. The riots were two blocks from my house in Nashville. So you get in a fiery answer, you should probably go into in all of this interview. But the bottom line is, um, I think we've got to show men what masculine greatness is and how God made them uh, and then inspire them to it and not spend all our time basically slapping their hands for, for misbehaving. Uh, and then we'll see ma ma massive things happen, beautiful things happen. I mean, that's good. I, I like that. You know, you talk about that fire kindled inside of a guy. You know, we, we say, you know, there, you, you have to keep kindling, little, little, literally keep adding to it to keep that fire going or it burns yes. out. I remember back in February, I don't know what it was, cabin fever or whatever. I just told my wife, I need to start a fire. Like I went outside and it was really challenging because of the snow and the weather, but we got a fire going and I needed to see that fire. I needed to have... Not that I couldn't start a fire, but I just felt like I needed to get out and do that. What is so compelling about a fire in a man's life? Well, I mean, first of all, it's just part of the human experience when we're young, you know, stand by a fire, maybe with dad, poke a stick in there, sticks, maybe some, some you know, s'mores or whatever, marshmallows or hot, hot dogs. It's just, it's just part of life. But I'll tell you, uh, as we get a little bit older, we have a sense of something about fire that I only learned when I wrote this book. And that is, you know, we, we, know the, we know the famous music group, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and most people quote those words thinking that fire is one of the elements, but fire is not. Uh, there's earth and wind, um, and, 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 and what's the other one? Earth, wind, and something. Um, but uh, fire is not an element. Fire is what happens when elements change forms. And so that got me even more excited, more excited about fire, because basically fire is what happens when uh, pre-existing things start to change. And I put that in the book because that, that really meant a great deal to me. So yeah, we all love fire for its warmth. We all love fire for its beauty. We all love fire because, you know, I'm a Christian, so I think we love fire because, you know, God is fiery and there's fiery and holy things and there's fire in sacrifices and all of those things. And fire is the illustration for like 15 different things. But for me now, when I light a fire, uh, I'm aware that if I just, I'm right here at my desk, I could actually light a match right here on camera. What's really happened is not an element doing anything, but a change has happened. And boy, of course, that's very relevant to what I'm writing about in the book, because what I'm calling men to is change. And that's what ignites fire. So anyway, uh, I think fire is just element of the human soul. It's how we're made. It's how God, uh, you know, wired us. And so uh, I've, I'm not surprised at all you had to light a fire. That, I, I, frankly, I think we had a, we don't want kids to burn the house down, but I think along about the age of 10, a boy goes, hey, there's fire. Let's do something with it. And we got to teach them how to do it the right way. It's funny you say that because every time we do light a fire, and now we have a fire pit, we're not being reckless, that it is very attractional. People love to stand around and talk around a fire. My kids love the idea of a fire. Um, and I think that's true when it comes to a man's spirit, a man's being that that fire needs to be lit. One of the challenges I think men face is, and we say it's, it's hard to lead someone on a trail where no one's ever showed you where to go. And, yes. and you address the idea of heritage. And there's a lot of men who have never had literally anything passed down to them. You talk about, you know, a military family and your upbringing. How did being in the military and being raised in that environment create the heritage that you're hopefully passing on as well? Well, I grew up in a situation that's, that made it easier for me in terms of heritage. My father was not the, not the kind of man who talked to me about being a man at all, but just the fact that he was an army officer, just the fact that I was on military bases. I mean, you're on a military base named for Stonewall Jackson or named for Patton or named for Eisenhower or named for whomever, Marshall. Um, so heritage leaks from everything. You know, when my father walked in the room with his uniform on, he had patches and 
and emblems of heritage. You go to the officers club to have dinner with your family. There's great big paintings of famous officers or heroes or sergeants who did noble things in World War II. It's constant. Um, and then of course, my father loved history as I do. So all of that lived in my life. But I'll have to tell you, uh, as, I, as I describe in the book, it wasn't until after my father died that I began to really dive into my personal family history to understand what lived in me almost biologically. And it changed me, it dramatically changed me. So I had the broad American heritage, the broad military heritage, the broad heritage of my father and my grandfather, my great grandfather being high ranking officers. That was great. There was still a more personal level of it because I've never served in the military. I, I, I lived between after drafts and between wars and it wasn't my calling. Um, so what I'm concerned about are the guys who have never been told anything about any kind of heritage, unlike me, and maybe have a very negative heritage, as you know, because you've looked over these chapters and maybe read the book. Um, the, the fact is that, uh, you know, I described the story of a man who just, his father was in prison, his wife and my mother died early from working herself to death. He ended up living with ex distant relatives. And he would have said he had nothing except the slight knowledge of migrant workers. The guy was Hispanic. And then he found out one thing, you'll have to read the book to find out what it is, everybody. But he found out one thing about his father that changed him. And he started a huge foundation based on this one thing. And it changed his heart and gave him peace more importantly. So I'm a big believer that, you know, I don't care if, let, I'm just making something up, but your, your XYZ ethnicity and every single person in your family line has been a nasty, disgusting, criminal, robbing, stealing, murdering, raping person. There's still something in your ethnicity. There's still something in your national history. There's still something that comes before you that should live in your soul and lift you. And men are made that way. We're made that way. That's how we talk. That's how we live. And I'll just say very quickly, I kind of specialized in African-American history. You can kind of get a sense of that in the book. And when I go into an African-American situation, young kids who have never been told anything good about them, quite frankly, other than maybe that their moms love them. And I talk about what blacks have accomplished through history. I'm telling you what, it lights up that room. Um, because they've never been told anything. They've never been told that Jesus looks more like them than me. They've never been told that a black man probably helped Jesus carry the cross. Uh, they've never been told what, what blacks have invented through history. If you've had a blood transfusion in your life, you need to thank a black man, because a black man designed the way of storing blood and the idea of a blood bank. So I just go on and on and on, and by the time it's over, they want to elect me king. But my point is that I'm just telling them their heritage, and that's the power of the heritage. You, you, you explode, you change, you live differently. You were meant to be in what, come, what comes before us. And most men have never had that, that glorious experience. I won't spoil the story, but you talk about being at a school assembly and, you know, that, that fire being kindled in an individual coming up to you and the guy you're with. And, 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 and that's true. When someone pulls that curtain back and says, you were created for so much more. And we work with men. We talk about, you know, we're not daddy daycare and we're not fight club. Okay. So we're somewhere in the middle. We want to channel that, you know, that warrior soul, that warrior spirit, because oftentimes it comes out of us. It's in us and it comes out in negative ways. But when you channel into that healthy warrior spirit, the world actually becomes a, a healthier place. Marriages are healed. Children get the parents they deserve. Could you explain that, how that changes our culture when men channel what's already inside of them? Yeah, I, I'm a big believer of this. Um, obviously, what I'm doing when I'm encouraging men to drink in the warrior spirit and have, keep the warrior alive in them, I'm not encouraging immoral violence or or any kind of nastiness, of course. Um, and by the way, most of us will only have invisible fights to fight. Most of us are never gonna have to pull a gun. We're never gonna have to fight somebody off for our property or the safety of our family, thank God. Um, if, you, if you do, I hope you're ready for it, you're prepared. But um, what's happening in our society is that the warrior is being worked out of us. Uh, I love the passage of scripture in Judges, I believe it's Judges 3, where God says to his leaders, uh, I don't want you to wipe out all the tribes in the promised land. I want to leave some tribes there so that the future generations have to have a battle experience. I don't want any generation to arise that doesn't have its own battle experience. And this is important. So a man today battles for mastery over himself. He battles for, for control of himself. He battles for the good of his wife, battles for the good of his children, battles for the ba band of brothers around him. Uh, battling might be praying, battling might be confronting, battling might be standing firm. There's a difference between the way my wife and I handle these things. Something comes up, she might describe it, and then she says, oh, it's not important, I'll take care of it. 
And I, I have a different response. No, let's stand together. Let's stand at the ramparts of your life. Let's, let's fight away. Let's fight these battles together. Um, you know, I have a different, I have a more of a warrior oriented to her or orientate, uh, orientating on it. So um, that's, that's what we've got to do. Now, yeah, I do believe in staying in good physical shape. And yeah, I do believe you ought to be able to defend your home. And yeah, but, but I'm not a survivalist. I'm not some crazy guy with 16 M16s in my office. You know, I'm just a guy who wants to be able to do the basic defense. But most of the battles, and I describe in the book, and this won't give anything away. I have a good band of brothers. One of the guys battles the kind of depression that Churchill and Lincoln did. Um, so suddenly, for no real reason, probably it may be biological, I don't know, but it's definitely got a spiritual element, he'll sink into, uh, you know, darkness. Well, we know how to come around him. We pray, we fast, we get him, we go do things, we smack him around, we have fun. Uh, you know, we, we ask if there's any recent source of this thing. We know how to battle against it. We've been walking with him for years. So all of that to say, keeping the warrior spirit alive. And one of the things I love about that chapter is years ago, I wrote, I, I drew out of scripture, seven warrior prayers from the Bible. So these are warrior prayers inspired in scripture um, and ones we ought to be praying. And I pray them all the time and it makes a massive difference in my life. So uh, keeping this warrior thing to get uh, focused in our lives and, and bringing it in, especially by the way, for those of us who have had very cushy, middle class, upper middle class lives, you know, more time in front of the TV than on the football field or the boxing rank or whatever. You know, we've never had to battle for anything except maybe our sister to get control of the car keys or something. And uh, we, we, we've got to keep the warrior going. And by the way, that, that's, that may be more important, both for the invisible, invisible kind of battles and the non-invisible battles uh, in the years to come. And I'm not saying we're going to, you know, war in the streets or anything, but you know, like I say, here just a week or two ago, well, this past weekend, I guess, uh, there were riots not too far from my home. Well, I, you know, my wife concerned. We can smell tear gas on our balcony in our downtown national home. I can, I can protect some things. I know how to do some things. We have some strategies in place. But mainly, we began to pray. And, you know, you have, you'd have to know more about my life to know how passionate I am for, for the cause of African Americans and how much I decry the racism out there. But I went, to, I went to war at every single level. And that's what a man's got to be able to do. And I want to help men do it more. You're right. Because we think about battles, we often think of the external battles, you know, stocking up on, you know, ammo or home security systems or prepping, as you, you know, talked about. But often the battle is internal. And that's what destroys us. Exactly. And we talk about Matthew 4, where Jesus in the wilderness, Satan used the word if three times. And the, the word if in our brains as men is often what destroys us if we are saved, if we are forgiven, if we mean anything, if we have any value, if, and if you get, you have to understand, you know, there are, you talk about that friend, we all journey through various seasons of life, whether it's your marriage or whatever, you talk about just kind of embracing and celebrating that season of life you're in. What do you tell a guy who's in one of those seasons right now where he's like, I, I don't like where I'm planted, but, but this is where I'm at. Every man's got to know that every season of his life is adding a layer to his preparation for what he's ultimately called to. Very, very important. You know, I worked, I worked at a place called Shakey's Pizza when I was in high school. And uh, I got to tell you, it wasn't the happiest things I've ever, I've ever done. But it added a layer to my preparation for things I couldn't even have known. I once worked on a chicken farm. That was a poopy, feathery experience, I can tell you. But uh, I, it, it prepared me. Uh, I, I, I left college and mowed yards a lot to, to, you know, at, at one stage in my life. It helped me. Uh, everything I've had to go through, every layer, every professional layer. And, and so that's what we have to understand. It's very clear in the book of Luke that if you are uh, faithful with worldly things, you'll be given spiritual things. If you're faithful with other people's property, you'll be given property of your own, etc. And so uh, this is how God works. This is how preparation works. God is always preparing you for something ultimate by doing, you know, for those of us who know the karate kid, wax on, wax off. That's the famous illustration. And of course, millennials are probably looking at me like right now going, what the heck are you talking about? But in the famous karate kid movie, this kid was told to wax, you know, busted up cars in a junkyard, but the movement of his arms and waxing on, waxing off prepared him for his karate moves that ultimately led to a championship. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, the movie's 20 years old. If you haven't seen it, you're, you're probably going to hell anyway. But all that to say, um, that's how it is in every stage of our lives. In fact, you know, here I am pretty, pretty later in life. Uh, and I'm, I'm very well aware that right now I'm in some seasons that are not actually about those seasons, although I'm doing well what I need to be tending, but they're actually about a future season. And I'm decades into my professional life. So 
that's what a man needs to know. It's how God works. It's how, it's how uh, business development works. It's how there's a constant layering process going on. And the foolish man tries to escape those. He tries to, he runs away from having to flip burgers while he's going to college. He runs away from having to paint houses during summers when he's paying for his college or whatever. He runs away from the less seemly parts of his job so he can just do the cool and sexy things. Well, it doesn't work that way. If you don't tend the whole of what you're given to be responsible for, you'll not be given promotion, not in the kingdom and not in natural things. So uh, I'm a big believer in that. I'm constantly urging men do your best, live up to the full of the obligations that you have now, and you'll be given more. That's how growth comes. Hey, go back to the garden before there was sin. God told, you know, Adam, work and keep, you know, essentially what's been entrusted to you. It's a privilege to do that. I think, you know, you talk about that word running away, you know, and, and if we're not careful, we attempt to skip over these seasons of life because we want to fast forward. We want it all right now. But one of the best ways or the, the ways that I've learned, and I know you talk about it in your book and books, is to expedite the process, you have to surround yourself with high caliber men, men who will call things out of you, but also encourage you at the same time. How does a man go about forging those type of high quality, high caliber relationships when he says, I don't have anybody right now, or I don't have, or I have friends who are actually taking away of what is good and my wife hates them and doesn't want them around. How do I develop camaraderie that is life giving? Yeah, it's a great question. Most men either walk alone or they are in a sea of casual relationships. But you will not become the man you're made to be if you don't have valiant men around you uh, that you have fun with, talk smack with, eat a lot with, but uh, who are challenging you while you're challenging, challenging them to be better men. So the first thing is uh, you've got to begin to turn the relationships you already have that are valuable uh, towards something more than just smack talk and pizza and, you know, basketball games. Um, t- turn to the guy in your life you feel closest to and say, what did you ever learn about being a man from your father? You know, I've been thinking a lot about manhood, how manhood forms. I want to be a good father to my son. What did you ever learn? You know, start talking about those themes and see which of your, let's, let's assume, dozen or so friends bites. Um, hand somebody a book and say, hey, and it ought to be a Mansfield book, by the way. Hand somebody a Mansfield book and say, or whatever book, uh, you know, John Eldridge, from Wild at Heart, any of those great books and book about men, and say, hey, this book meant a lot to me. Why don't you read it? We'll talk about it over pizza next week or whatever. You begin to identify those guys who want to step in with you. And for the real shy guys who don't have any uh, buddies at all, uh, one of the things you want to learn is the art of the indirect connection. Uh, men don't bond by circling up in chairs in a room and staring at each other and saying, how are you feeling today, Fred? And that just makes us all want to run. Instead, we bond by doing other things, the indirect connection, helping the widow, you know, helping the widow with paint her house or taking care of the kids in the neighborhood or helping a guy with his, fix his car or whatever, while we do other things. Anybody can, can have a game party, you know, when we finally get back to football this fall, you know, you order up some burgers or some steaks and you have guys over. You create some kind of indirect way for guys to connect. And then you start, as you get in these relationships, you start talking about the themes we're talking about now and seeing who bites. Over time, you can bring them into a deeper and closer relationship. What you ultimately want is a thing I call in my little booklet, Building Your Band of Brothers, you want the free fire zone. The free fire zone is a situation among men where anything that needs to be said to make you better will be said. Nobody's sitting around wringing their hands going, oh my gosh, I hope somebody talks to him. Uh, nobody's distancing themselves because there's a stink. Um, if, we're ba- if we're in a band of brothers together, I love you, we're having fun, we're taking trips, we're doing things together, we're men, but nothing goes by, not your messy way of eating, not the way you mistreat your wife on the phone, uh, not the stink, the way, in fact you do well with your daughter and poorly with your son, Uh, Not your grammar, for heaven's sakes, not your mismanagement of money. Whatever we can see as friends who are committed to you, we'll sit you down and say, hey, we want you to be a good man. We want you to be victorious. We want you to be a success in life. Here's something we see. We want to help coach you through this. That's how a band of brothers works. And I got to tell you, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am if it wasn't for a band of brothers. There's no question about it. Amen. (laughs) I was just telling a man that today. I said there were men at different times in my life that spoke a truth to me that hurt in the moment. As a matter of fact, I maybe got defensive or maybe even dismissed it, but I will, those are defining moments in my life that I will always go back to and say, I remember that truth. And I don't want to be 80, 85 years old and nobody having the courage to say, you know, you're a jerk or you, you talk to your wife really disrespectfully or, or whatever. Um, so you're absolutely right. And we, get, we have to intentionally seek out those relationships 
you know, one, one of the things you talk about in your book is not a topic men like to talk about is love. And you talk about pursuing that and that idea, but it's something we need to embrace. Could you just, without giving it all away, could you just explain that to us? Yeah, I think love has been reserved for women or it's been reserved for romance novels and men don't really get to it. But a lot of what we are about as men is what we love. Uh, I love my country and it's better and it's better, you know, values. Uh, I love the men around me. I love my children. I love the culture of men. I love it. Um, and so we sometimes are hesitant to use the word love, but love really is what animates us. Love really is a dynamo inside of us. It's a fire. Um, in fact, you're most inflamed in life by what you love. So if you're constantly avoiding the word love or the concept of love, you're going to miss it. So I try in this chapter to rip the word love from the, you know, what they call the bodice rippers, the, you know, luscious breath novels that, that people tend to read sometimes and put it where it needs to be. It's the most important thing in our world. We love God. We love our wives. We love our cause. We love our professions. Um, I love to work out. I love what I feel in my body and my muscles when I'm working out. I love it. Uh, and I love sharing that with other guys. In fact, I even love getting hit. You know, I'm an old lineman. Uh, and so I still love to pick up basketball games or the football stuff where you're, you know, guys are bumping into guys. And I just love it. So th see, Right now, some of the guys listening are like, well, that's not love. I thought love was about flowers and Valentine's Day and what my wife wants on a date. Well, it, it certainly is about that, but it's not all about that. And so a man, I'm not going to give away what's in the chapter because I want to force guys to the book and you're not asking me to do that. But I'm just saying, uh, I, I, love has is, is got to be re understood differently um, as a deep and passionate thing. And by the way, uh, love is something that has to be tended. Uh, and I don't just, I don't just mean, although I certainly mean with flowers and gifts and date nights. I mean, I, obviously I, I want all of that. I want you to be the best lover of, of the woman in your life. Uh, you can possibly be, I want you to develop all the skills and learn how to wear deodorant. I want you to do all of it. But what I am saying is that there are broader loves than that. When you stand on a mountaintop with the, uh, with the bonfire going behind you and the, the steaks roasting. And, uh, if you smoke a stogie, maybe a stogie in your hand. And your guys over there, you guys are about to pull around the fire and have a great meal and then talk about life after a good day of hunting or whatever it is you're about. I'm telling you what, that's love. All of those elements are love. So we got to restore the masculine definition and understanding of love so that men will give themselves to it. You know, what we're ultimately talking about here is a much bigger picture. So it's easy for a guy to hear this and go, nah, whatever. You know, that's just guy, you know, read a book, go, I'm good. I have a job. I, you know, I'm not divorced. Um, I have my kids. I'm at least I'm not, you know, it's easy to settle. What you're talking about is a legacy. You're talking about something much bigger than just existing. Why is the idea of legacy so important in a man's life? Because the man is made to leave a legacy. That's the thing he's got to know. You are not made just to live in this generation and then all of your impact die when you're laid into your grave. Uh, you're not made, I, I believe, even for your legacy to just be your family's memories of you. I think we're made to do something more. We're made to establish a culture. We're made to establish ways and values and rituals and maybe even investments and institutions and other things um, that last for generations. Uh, I want to have an impact on my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. I want to help shape my nation. I want to help shape the church, the body of Christ. Um, I want to have an impact that survives me. And by the way, in my case, I don't want to just leave a book of shelves, a, a, a shelf of books. But books will eventually dissipate. New books will be written. You know, as an author, I'll be forgotten. But what can I light up in the lives of my children? What institutions can I start? What can I fund at a university? Um, what can I teach? What can I put out there? How can I launch a generation? You understand what I'm saying? I want this to survive me. So that's, that's me. That's Stephen Mansfield. I'm a little bit more on stage than most people. But every guy uh, wants to leave and should leave and is made to leave a legacy. We think about the next generation. We think about what's coming next. And so uh, that's part of what, how a man wants to think. And it, and it ennobles him. It lifts him. Uh, you know, I've literally talked a man out of killing himself by asking him to think about how this will be remembered by his children, his grandchildren, et cetera. And the legacy kept him from doing it. I said, yeah, there's nothing, there's hardly anything you can do that will erase this. The story will be there. Your, his father killed himself. His grandfather killed himself. There's suicide in that family. 
you're going to taint the whole family line. And by the way, the way this guy was a pretty successful doctor and had potential to do tremendous things. He was still young, but but the idea of legacy talked him out of making that stupid mistake. Why? Because men are made to leave something that survives them and does good in the world. So I'm when I'm talking about legacy, I'm talking about everything from what you write on the hearts of your children to what you fund at the local university. Uh, to what you what you devote your company to that's going to survive you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, books, and yeah, speeches, and yeah, people you get to impact, and, and yeah, the way you get to shape that young man over hamburger and so on. All of that is legacy, and men are meant to live for it. We're not meant to live just to earn enough money to keep us in pizza and beer. Uh, we're meant to live something, uh, live a life that that lives beyond us, and that's, that's what a legacy is about. And of course, I go into greater detail in the book. Well, and understanding that meant to live would have to go back to how did I get here? You know, how, why am I here? What's my purpose, et cetera. And one of the things I, I really appreciate about your writing is it, it is, is centered in, you know, the almighty is in God. God has written our, his DNA on us. And without having God as your creator, you're searching for the most radical version of manhood you can find because we're all seeking a purpose that unfortunately then would end once we stop breathing. But with legacy and understanding God's DNA is written on us, it goes, we're talking about eternity. We're talking about immortality. Um, how has understanding God affected your view of, of manhood and, and masculinity in your life? Yeah, it's made a massive difference because I believe that masculinity, of course, is a gift from God, just like I believe that femininity, being a woman, is a gift from God. Uh, so I believe that you, in the same way that I have to read the uh, you know, the manual of the manufacturer of my car to run it right. If I'm going to be a good man, if I'm going to be a great man, to, to use the phrase that we use around here, uh, that I'm going to have to understand what God intended. And so God is the author of my masculinity. God wants to relate to me as a man. God wants to heal me and extend me and empower me as a man. So I have to go back to the source. And this is why I'm so fiery in that chapter. I talk about how religion has been feminized. I'm not blaming women for that, by the way. Um, how religion has been feminized. And so I talk pretty bluntly about how we've driven men off in churches. Uh, and I do a little riff on the life of Jesus. I mean, Jesus can be presented as this, you know, slightly light, light in the arches guy who carries a sheep under his arm while he's wearing a bathrobe. Or you can look at the way it's really told, you know, a guy who had a rough profession in a rough part of the world in an occupied country, you know, where people were killed on a regular basis. He would walk down the street and see crucifixions, um, uh, you know, oh, and, and, and I could just go on and on. His father died when he was young. His brothers didn't really believe in him. He was hunted every day of his life. There were conspiracies to kill him, blah, blah, blah. He just go on and on and on. He goes back to his hometown shortly after he announces himself publicly. And what do they do? They have a riot and they try to throw him off a cliff and kill him because of something he said, by the way, about the, the, the untouchables, the, the undesirable ones uh, uh, in his generation, almost, almost like the racial tensions we have today. So I just go on a long riff about that. Why? Because I want men to come back to God, come back to Jesus, come back to faith, and realize that, that just because they maybe have gone to a church that fit their wives better than it fit them, doesn't mean that the Christian faith is not perfectly suited for men. It's made for men. It was, you know, men are in mind in this whole thing. And so I hit pretty hard in that chapter, but it's because I don't think, I, I mean, I certainly understand that, that an atheist man can be good at some level, but to really be from the core out, uh, the man's God, God has made you to be, you've got to embrace the author and you've got to have his power in your life. And so that's why I hit so hard on that in the chapter. Amen. And it keeps us from having this fleeting passion. You know, James talks about looking in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what you're looking like. God could, you know, guys yes. can listen to this podcast. Sorry, guys can listen to this podcast and be on fire, take the earbuds out and go back to being, you know, a worthless human being and yelling at their wife or whatever. It has to be grounded in something far greater than just want to. And, and God has, has written that on us. You talk about a, a ritual that you, you, you know, dedicate yourself here to, to kindling that fire. Could you speak into that, that these guys go, I want to take it besides buying this book, but I want to take it further than just going, I want to and move it to, I will. Yeah. I, I, I describe in a short little chapter right at the end of the book, a ritual that I have in mind. I've just, I've just, you, if you read the, if you read the book, you'll come to this chapter after you've read about seven fires. So I don't think the ritual alone is enough, but it's a beginning. And what I urge guys to do is once they've committed themselves to these seven fires, I want to have these things burning in my life. Or I realize I've got five of them going really, really well, but I don't have this one over here. 
I want to urge guys, of course, I want them to talk, talk it through with your band of brothers, talk it through with your sons. Uh, and then at some point, I think they ought to have some ritual uh, in which there are seven fires. It can be seven fires in a field. It can be seven candles. It can be seven matchsticks. I don't care about the size of the fire. That's up to what you can handle. Uh, but the fact is you have seven fires. And what you're basically doing, each, each group of guys can kind of script their own, their own exact ritual. But basically, you're, each fire is labeled. This is the fire. You know, this represents the fire of heritage. This represents the fire of destiny, et cetera. And they say, say standing near that fire, they commit to their guys, I'm going to get this fire kindled in my life. I'm doing great on the others, but I, I have no sense of heritage whatsoever. My family was a mess, and I have no sense of heritage. But I stand before these men, and I commit that I will recover heritage and let it live in my life. Hold me accountable in a year. Uh, let's see if I've done it, et cetera. I, I think that, uh, that ought to be what happened. And then, of course, uh, uh, there ought to be a lot of food and eating and carrying on and smack talk. But the point is, um, that's the way of men. But, but I think this solemn ritual ought to be a commitment to God and a commitment to each other, and in some cases, commitment to their sons. Um, we're going to do this together. And by the way, I think that's exactly that ought to be part of our kind of bar mitzvah ceremonies we have for our young men, our sons, as they come into manhood. Um, if I had thought of this back when my son was 13, that was, uh, what, uh, 12 years ago, more than that, 22 years ago, um, my, I, I, would have, I would have loved him because we had a big uh, coming of age, you know, turning 13 celebration for him. And I wish I'd had those seven fires that said, son, this is the stuff that defines a lot of who a man is. I want you to commit yourself to each of these seven fires and keep, keep them before your eyes in your life. And I think it would have made a big difference. So uh, again, not trying to do anything mystical or dark or weird or satanic, uh, but just simply have uh, a ritual where men are committing and asking for help and calling on God to empower these seven fires being ignited in their souls. And I think you'll know that you have that brotherhood when you can pray, cry, you know, intercede for one another and yet make fun of e each other and guys walk away with nicknames. It's a little yes. bit of both. If you, if you only have the serious stuff, you probably got a Bible study. If you only have the jack wagon stuff, you probably got a fraternity going. It's, it's a little bit of both and uh, they're both life giving and they're both, they should be embraced on both sides. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what makes it so compelling. Uh, the culture of men inv involves all of those elements and, I, and that's what I love. You can have, you can have guys, I've, I've, I've watched at some of these gatherings, a guy is in tears at what's being said, but he's tending the beef on the grill at the same time. You know, that's, that's the nature of men, you know, to be doing while things are circulating in their hearts. So uh, each, each band of brothers, each, each group of men, each men's group in a church, each men's gathering in a home, they can decide their own exact approach to the seven fires. There can be a Jewish approach, a Muslim approach, a Christian approach. You know, I'm speaking to all of those kinds of men. Um, but uh, the main thing is that you commit yourself to these seven fires because I'm not sure a man is fully whole until these fires are burning at some level in his soul. Amen. Um, well, let's, let's talk about that. How do guys get in touch with you? How do they find their book, your book, and also Great Man TV? Like, where do we find that stuff, Stephen? Yeah, my, my personal site is stephenmansfield.tv. Uh, that's where you can track me. We have a website for men, greatman.tv, all of our stuff's.tv. Um, that, that's also the name of the Twitter feed for men, Great Man TV. And of course, my, all, all of my personal media is Man, Mansfield Writes. At this point, and probably for a while, because Amazon made a huge purchase of these books, uh, the best price is on Amazon. I would tell you if it was different, but the best price is on Amazon. I think it's the book, the book is a $17 book, and it's down, I think, like $9.50 or $10. $10. So that's the best place to get them right now, and, and they won't run out anytime soon because they made a huge pre-order, which I'm very grateful for. So go on Amazon, get the book, and let me challenge you to do something. You know, one of the things my publisher did was publish this in paperback on purpose. I, I, I've done a big, fancy, expensive hardback book for men. That book is now like 24 bucks, and it's worth it as a gift. It's worth it to read, of course. But I want this book to be a movement book. So I want to challenge all you guys. If you buy one, buy two. If you buy five, buy 10. It's not that expensive. And give them away. You make sure, don't buy one for yourself and not get one to your sons-in-law or your sons or the good guy your daughter's dating or the guys in your church thing. I'm not just trying to sell books. I'm trying to start a lot and continue to feed a movement. I want, I want to get your help in that. So thanks very much for asking about that. That's, that's, a, that's a real important step for us. Well, Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, I've given so many copies of those away. I've taken men's studies through those, a couple different men's studies, but uh, the book Man on Fire right here, I got some post-it notes already hanging out in there. Um, it's a good book when post-it notes start climbing out the side, but uh, man, I, 
I, I can't thank you enough. I appreciate this. I know the guys that listen to this will uh, go check out that book. As you said, it's on Amazon. Make sure you grab it. And what I have found with your books, God of Guinness, whatever, um, they're books that you, you will recommend to others and you can proudly display them. Men need a library, but men need to do something with the books that are in their library. So yes. if you're just yeah. reading to read, you might as well just get the newspaper, but read to apply. That's where we move towards obedience and real life change. That's right. That's right. Hey, it's been great to be on the program, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. Make sure to leave a comment or question to keep the conversation going. I would also appreciate if you would share this show with your friends as we seek to build better men together. Thank you.